This is the second of two videos talking about section 6.1. In this video, I'll be talking about future value. So we've already seen that if we integrate the velocity from zero to t by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we need to find an antiderivative of velocity, which is position. And then we plug in t, we plug in zero, and we subtract. So this is just writing that principle symbolically. And if the x that you see here looks a little strange, if you're thinking to yourself, why are those x's rather than t's? Remember that we do this sometimes when we talk about area functions so that we don't get the upper bound of my integral here, t, confused with the variable that I'm integrating with. But otherwise, that x doesn't really uh, represent anything in particular. Now, if I take that equation and I add s of 0 to both sides, what we get is a formula for the future position, the position of the object at some future time. So this says that s of t is equal to the initial position, s of 0, plus this displacement. So it says if you want to know where the object is at a future time, you take its initial position, you add however much the object got displaced over that period of time, and then you end up with where the object is now. So here's an example. So let's say we have this velocity graph. So we see that our axis is labeled v here. So this is a graph of velocity. And we've got some areas labeled. And we're also given that s of 0 equals 20. We're given this initial value. And now that's not information that we would be able to get any other way. That's not information that we can read off of this graph, because this is a graph of velocity. So we would have no way of knowing where this object is located at time 0. But now that we know where the object is located at time 0, we can figure out where the object is located at future times. So if I want s of 3 by what we said on the previous slide, that's going to be s of 0 plus the displacement over the interval from 0 to 3. So I integrate my velocity from 0 to 3. Now I don't need to use the x here because my upper bound is just the number 3 rather than the variable t. I only really need to use that dummy variable x when there's a risk of confusing t being used in two different ways. Okay, so s of 0, they tell me that's 20. Now what's the value of this integral? Well, we've got a graph of our function. We've got a graph of velocity. So if we're integrating from 0 to 3, what we know is that what we have is the net area of this function from 0 to 3. We have 12 units of positive area and 16 units of negative area. So the net area from 0 to 3 is 12 plus negative 16. And we add all this together, and we end up with 16. So that's the position of the object at t equals 3. And we can do something very similar to figure out the position at t equals 5. So s of 5 is s of 0 plus the integral from 0 to 5 of my velocity function. So again, that'll be 20. And if I integrate from 0 to 5, I have positive 12 units, negative 16 units, and then positive 10 units again, all the way up to my ending point, 5. So 12 plus negative 16 plus 10, and that's going to work out to be 26. Now what do we do if we have a formula? Well, same basic idea. So again, we're given a formula for the velocity, we're given an initial position, and then we're asked to find the position at some future time, in this case, t equals 6. So the position of the object at t equals 6, that's just saying in words, s of 6. So from my formula, I know that s of 6 is going to be s of 0 plus the integral from 0 to 6 of my velocity function, which in this case is 9 minus t squared. s of 0, they tell me, is negative 2. And when I integrate, I get the antiderivative of 9 minus t squared. That's going to be 9t minus 1 third t cubed. Plug in 6, plug in 0, and subtract. So we're going to get negative 2 plus 9 times 6 minus 1 third times 6 cubed. And that's going to be minus 9 times 0 minus 1 third times 0 cubed. Plug all, the, plug all of that into our calculator. And that's going to work out to be negative 20. Now, a negative answer could be something that makes sense here, right? So there's nothing that tells us that a negative position wouldn't make sense. This just means that the object started two units in the negative direction and ended up 20 units in the negative direction. Now, this idea of using the rate of change together with an initial value to find a future value applies to any kind of function, not just position and velocity. So if we have any kind of quantity that's changing over time, and we know the initial quantity, q of 0, the quantity at time 0, and we also know the rate of change, the derivative, q prime of t, then we can use this together with the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the value of our quantity at some future time. And again, it's the same idea. The future value is equal to the initial value 
plus, in this case, we're not calling this displacement, but what that is is the net change of my quantity over time. Remember that when we integrate, our definite integrals represent net area, so it could be a positive change, could be a negative change. So again, working through an example here. So here our quantity is the number of cells in a culture. We're told that the culture has 100 cells at time t equals zero. So again, that's them telling us that n of zero equals 100. So that's how we interpret has a population of 100 cells at time t equals zero. And then the number of cells is changing at a rate of n prime of t equals 90 times e to the negative 0.1 t cells per hour. We wanna find the number of cells in the culture after 24 hours. So that's asking for n of 24, which very similar to what we did before is gonna be n of zero plus the integral from zero to 24 of my derivative n prime of t. So we already know what n of zero is, we just have to work out that integral. So we have 100 plus the integral from zero to 24. n prime, they tell us is 90 times e to the negative 0.1t. This is going to be a substitution because we've got this inside function 0.1t here. So I'm gonna let u equal negative 0.1t. My du is going to be negative 0.1 dt. So that means that I need to put a negative 0.1 in here next to the dt, and I'm going to have to put a 1 divided by negative 0.1 out front of the integral. So I have 100. Now 1 divided by negative 0.1, that works out to be negative 10. When I change my bounds, I get negative 1, negative 0.1 times 0 is still 0. Negative 0.1 times 24 is negative 2.4 and then I get 90 times e to the u du. Negative 10 times 90 is 900, and the antiderivative of e to the u is e to the u, and now I have to plug in negative 2.4 and zero and subtract. So I have 100 minus 900 e to the negative 2.4 minus 900 e to the zero. And when we plug all of that into our calculator, we get 918.35. We can't have a decimal of a cell, right? We can't have half of a cell. So the only kind of answer that would make sense here would be a whole number. So we'll go ahead and round to the nearest whole number and say 918 cells. So that's the basic idea, right? So the calculus, the actual evaluating of the integral, that's where we're gonna use our techniques. In this case, we already learned about substitution and that's what we needed in this case. So any antiderivative tools that we have, we're gonna use here. But the basic idea of future value equaling the initial value plus the net change over time, that's a principle that applies both to position and velocity as well as any quantity that's changing.